Uh, well, I, I told Chuck, I said, we're going to be here a while tonight because we're only in chapter three and we got to got through, get through the whole rest of the book. So I hope you guys brought a sleeping bag, snacks, coffee. Uh, thankfully, we don't have any second uh, story windows, so I think we'll be fine. Well, so this is this is the basic outline we've looked at. You guys should be pretty familiar with that by now. So we've went through Think Holy, Act Holy. We're just going to kind of go more rapidly through the rest of the book. Um, obviously, since we don't have time to go real in-depth, but where you can still kind of get a good idea of what is being said and the basic argument. Um, so uh, we started, we went to verse 11 uh, last week, and he was talking about the different things to, to take off, you know, like um, lying and, and greed and those kinds of things. And, uh, you know, it's, it's funny, whenever we're talking about, whenever we read things in the Bible, it tells us things we need to change. <laughs> we all don't think we have anything to change. <laughs> like, somewhere deep inside of us, we read this and we're like, man, I know somebody who could really use this. And then we go to the next page, and we just move on with our lives. But I, I think that uh, Paul more meant it more to be used introspectively. So uh, here in verse 12, it says, Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a grievance against one another, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you all are also to forgive. Above all, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And let the peace of Christ, to which you were also called in one body, rule your hearts and be thankful. I like how those that in there. And be thankful. <laughs> <laughs> Take that. <laughs> uh, so before we were talking about the things we need to stop doing, but now he kind of switches gears and he talks about um, things we need to start doing, the things we need to put on. So he talked about the clothes to take off. Now he's talking about the clothes to put on. We don't want to be naked, right? <laughs> so so then we... <laughs> so there's a lot of really good stuff there. I really wish we had more time to look at it all. Um, I definitely encourage you to go back and read through Colossians, you know, two or three times back to back. Try to read it through the whole book in, in one sitting, and you're going to kind of see how the different things that we've talked about really, you know, um, fits together. So then uh, the next part, he's talked about think holy and then act holy, things not to do, and then the things to do instead. And then he goes to talking holy in verse 16, and says this, Let the word of, word of, <laughs> word of Christ dwell richly among you, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, sing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Again, the idea of gratitude. Um, I think part of that is because life is life. It's so easy to let life rob us of our joy uh, and happiness and thankfulness and that, those kinds of things. So, uh, so uh, these things that he's mentioning here, th these are things that come from the heart, right? The the um, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Th these are things that come from our heart. It's not just a word that we're repeating lines on a on a screen. That, that's not the idea here. These things um, are come from the heart. And uh, it, it's not something you say just to sound right. Sometimes we, we get caught up in the religiosity of things, and we try to do things that, that seem like they're more spiritual. And uh, oftentimes what we do is we get, you know, the newest worship song, and, oh, man, this is so great. It really moves me. And then we look for the next newest worship song because we keep needing these these things to, to make us feel like we're spiritual. You know what I mean? And uh, that's really not, it's not, worship isn't supposed to necessarily be something that tickles your heart. It's supposed to be something that comes from your heart. And it can tickle your heart, but the idea isn't just to, to chase things that make you excited or happy. Um, and so what that means for us is that if you don't feel like it, if you don't feel like worshiping, you don't feel like praying, you don't feel like reading the Bible, you don't feel like serving others, I just don't feel like it today. I just I just don't feel like it. That's all the more reason to do it. When you worship, even though you don't feel like worshiping, that that's real worship, and that's actually what makes it worship, when you're actually, when it costs you something. There's a story in the Old Testament where King David is about to, he's one of the kings of Israel, he's about to, to offer a sacrifice to God, and the guy that he goes to buy the sacrifice from, he says, you know what, you just take it. Um, you're the king, and I'm just going to, you know, help support you and, and this stuff. That's, that's great. I'm blessing you. And King David says this. He says, no, 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 I'm not going to offer something to God that didn't cost me anything. 
And so sometimes we think that we have to always feel it or always be into it or, or, or prove our worth to God before we can sing a song and that kind of stuff. But that's definitely not what, what these kinds of verses let us know. It's rather, it doesn't matter what I feel like. It matters what I, that I'm saying in truth. You know, uh, to, to kind of steal from what Chuck was talking about this morning, it doesn't matter if I'm experiencing doubt. I'm not going to let it move me to unbelief. And so kind of going on, on those lines. And um, worship becomes a much more uh, interactive and personal experience when we do that. Um, so if you look there, it says, let the word of Christ dwell Christ. It's Christ. Let the, let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another. Okay, well, hold on. Did you, see, did you catch that? In all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another. How? Through the Psalms and the hymns and spiritual songs. See, we oftentimes think we have to have these, these real lengthy sermons for everybody. Oh, there's somebody here who's in need. When, when, when a lot of times we're just encouraging one, one another in the church. We're just, we're just coming together and saying, hey, let's worship Jesus. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of wisdom to when you see somebody struggling, not trying to give them the 15-minute lecture or trying to solve all their problems, but just listening and, you know, kind of being showing uh, empathy. And then, um, you know, going and saying, hey, let's, let's go worship God. And uh, there's, there's just a lot there. So, once again, I really wish we could spend more time on this, but alas, we don't have it. So think holy, act holy, talk holy. Now he gets to this last section, um, where, which is where he's going to talk about applying holiness uh, to your life. And it starts with this verse right here, 17. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. So basically he said, okay, we've talked about all these things. I, I, corrected, your, I, I, I corrected your beliefs and your thoughts and your actions. Okay, so now that we're doing all this, the things you're talking about, okay, all right. So now, in case I missed anything, Whatever you do, this is a summary verse. It summarizes everything that he said so far. In word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And then that takes us into the, into the next part. So he's given us this, the, the general statement. And now he's going to go into specific applications of holiness. How you take holiness, the idea of holiness he's been talking about, and apply it uh, to your life. And so then he starts talking about uh, wives and then husbands and then uh, he goes on to children, and then he goes on to um, the uh, masters and slaves. He just goes through a whole list of different things they can apply to their lives. Um, so wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. Oops, sorry. As is fitting uh, in the Lord. And then he's going to go on uh, in the next next verse uh, to talk about the husbands. So one thing that Paul has oftentimes been accused of uh, in, in the modern era, uh, not just by people outside of the church, but also by a lot of Christians, is the idea of, is Paul sexist? Are the things that the Bible says about, uh, you know, relationships between husband and wife or, you know, man and woman and so on and so forth, are they outdated? Should they be done away with? Is this a different different age that things have, you know, um, no longer really apply like they used to? And uh, a lot of times you hear people, I, I want to say this, when I, was, when I was a kid, I had this pastor who was talking to me and he said, you know, if you go down that route, you start picking and choosing everything in the Bible, what you're going to believe and what you're not going to believe. And... At the time, I didn't think much about it, but the older I get, the more it kind of makes sense. When you, when you, when something in the Bible, you read it, and your instant reaction is to get offended, like everybody gets offended about everything nowadays, instead of to say, "What can I learn from this? What is there here for me now today in the 21st century? What, what, what what's there now?" And um, when we have that different mindset of going to the Bible to learn instead of to disprove it and to prove it wrong and so forth and so on, we, we're we going to get a lot more out of it. I, I, and so now that we've kind of gone through that, is Paul, is Paul just sexist? Well, you're left with one of, two, one of two conclusions. Either A, the Bible is the inerrant, infallible Word of God, or it is not. That's it. It all comes down to that. Now, if you don't believe that the Bible is God's Word, crisis averted. Go along with the rest of your life. You now have no standard of morality or righteousness in your life. You have no way of knowing anything about Jesus at all either because you are throwing away the best document of Jesus. So if that's the crazy world you want to live in, by all means, don't let me stop you. However, um, Christianity has always been founded on the idea that the Bible is God's word. And so then you get to these verses where it talks about wives submitting to their husbands. It's like, what is going on here? How can I possibly rectify that? Because our culture is a lot different. 
than it was back then. And here's just a few things I want to say. First off, sometimes people level against Paul that he was just um, the basically his view here. It reflects the society that he lived in at the time, and uh, so he basically Paul is socially conditioned to where the, the historical context he's in. And the question that becomes, and Blomberg asks this question wonderfully, if Paul simply mirrored the social conditioning that he lived in, that would mean that nowadays we have to mimic modern non-Christian society norms as well, which means that the church, there should be Christians who are transgenders, Christians who are homosexuals, Christians should be getting divorces, Christians should have um, you know, children who aren't disciplined, Christians should have, uh, you know, should be uh, immature, should be financially in debt, because we should mirror the standard of what's around us. So then the question becomes, well, what's wrong with that? It's like, well, you know, every culture does that. I think every generation does that. My generation's right, y'all are wrong. I mean, look at look at the kids now, these kids nowadays. Uh, how how they how they say things like, to them, the most important things in the whole world, global warming. That's number one. Uh, acceptance and tolerance, that's number two. Uh, and then number three would probably be, off the top of my head, maybe something to do with politics. Um, or if not politics, then uh, just being a nice, good person. Something like that. And uh, so that still leaves us with this big dilemma. If we simply dismiss what Paul wrote because he was nothing more than a product of his time, then that means that we have to do the exact same thing now and be a product of our time. That means we're not being renewed by God's Spirit. We are conforming to the image of the world. Isn't that exactly what Paul told us not to do? So we have this really weighty issue, and it's hard to deal with. But if we, as we look through Christian history and church history, we see that these are the original standards that, that the Christians had for their family structure. And it endured for hundreds and hundreds of generations, or I'm sorry, not generations, years, hundreds and hundreds of years throughout the generations. So really, this is more of a modern problem. And give it another 50 years, and there'll be something else that they don't like about the Bible. So with that kind of as, as the lock-in, I would say, no, Paul is not sexist. Rather, he is talking about something that is misunderstood in today's culture. So today, when people hear wives submit, this is what they think. You have to be a yes woman. You have to go along with whatever your husband says. You have no say-so. Your husband gets the final say. The buck stops there. With all the purchases, he makes them. You stay out of it. With the finances, he deals with it. You stay out of it. With how the house is run, he decides. You stay out of it. And that's the kind of the idea that we have of what the word submit means. I don't see this. I, I just biblically, I don't see this being how the word is used in the Bible. For instance, the Bible tells us to be submitted to the, to the government. It tells us to be submitted to one another. So surely whatever he's talking about doesn't mean submission to the point of no longer existing. And I think that as we look at the, the gospel as a whole and what it did for equality and for women and men and blacks and whites and everything in between, I think that what we see over and over and over again is that Paul is ad advocating for women to have a certain mindset, a certain attitude when they go to things. And I think that if I had more time, once again, if I was going to be here for a couple more weeks, we, we'd talk more about this and I'd unpack it for you. But since I don't, I'll try to make it as short and sweet as possible. The mindset that Paul is talking about is one of not being combative and challenging, not being vengeful. Now, if you've been married, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Sometimes it's hard to get behind your husband. <laughs> you know what I mean? He says things that kind of irritate you, does things that's kind of stupid, comes home from work that's kind of tired, doesn't really contribute to the house sometimes, things like that. Maybe uh, maybe he doesn't, uh, he's not as spiritual as you like him to be all the time. Uh, you know, maybe he's not sensitive enough. Um, maybe he's too harsh with the kids. Uh, maybe, um, whatever. Uh, maybe it feels like a power struggle more than a marriage. So you're going to this thing thinking, well, if he's not going to meet me in the middle, I'm not going to have sex with him. And so then we start doing that. We start having little power plays. It's either going to be rooted around who has the power, right? 
in sex or in finances and so on and so forth. It's going to be an issue of who has the power. That's all it's going to be, a power struggle. And uh, so for when, you, when marriage degrades to that point, you have it literally just degrading in on itself and kind of just falling in on itself where it's unsustainable. Uh, because marriage is supposed to be based on communication, love, forgiveness, and faithfulness. But if you don't have those things, you just kind of have nothing. And it's hard to keep going when there is nothing to build on. So one of the things that men crave more than anything is respect. Men follow respect. They chase it with all their fiber of their being, consciously and subconsciously, whereas women, not so much. They're more concerned with love. And so women show their husbands love, but have a hard time giving them respect. Men treat their wives with respect, but forget to show them love. Oh, I, I did it. And it's like, yeah, but I don't feel loved. That's stupid. That's ridiculous. Of course you're loved. That's something a man would say, right? That's how men think. They're more like, is this helping your productivity in this household? No? Well, you already know that I love you, so why are you making a big deal out of this? Just let it go. That's something a man would say. Whereas a woman would say, you just don't care about me like you used to. Because we don't understand each other the same. I, all these people, now, seriously, just a little side note here. All these people nowadays who are saying that men, there's no difference between men and women, I'm just like, really? Have you never been married? <laughs> there's nothing but differences. What are you guys talking about? Uh and I'm not just talking about sexual organs. I'm, I'm talking about the very heart of a person. Like, it's just so much ingrained in them. And yeah, sometimes you have girls that act kind of boyish, in the, like the tomboy, but not boyish in the sense of comprehending boys. And sometimes you're going to have a guy that's really emotional, maybe hasn't found his uh, inner, ma inner man yet, I guess. Uh, but that doesn't make him like a woman. That's just, you know, part of the development process. And... Uh, just a lot of confusion there, and I just don't get how anybody could land on the thing of, of men and women are the same. And I'm just like, they're not, though. They're just so different. <laughs> so different. Uh, so going back to what I was talking about. Um, all Christians should have this attitude, yes, but marriage specifically, the wife is, is told to have, have this attitude, whereas the husband is not. So whereas, generally speaking, Christians are to be, you know, subjected to each other, submitted to one another. In the confines of marriage, it's only the wife who's told specifically to have this. And oddly enough, it's only the man who's instructed to love his wife. The wife is never instructed to love her husband, <laughs> which takes us back to the thing I said about respect and love. It's just something he doesn't have to tell a woman to love her man. <laughs> it's just probably going to happen all by itself. It's how women communicate. Um, it's just kind of like their bread and butter. And so one of the things that we see, and once again, we really don't have time to be on this much longer. One of the things we see here is that uh, wives are to have the same relationship to their husband as Jesus had with the Father. This is mirrored in the creation. It's mirrored in the gospel. And so do you think that Jesus was less God because he was submitted to the Father? Well, if you have a problem with your spouse, chances are you do think that. Because we believe the things that we see, and we copy the things that we believe. So, if we're going to our marriage and saying, well, you know, Jesus, you know, uh, he was, you know. He, he, <laughs> sometimes we're going we're gonna to try and, and twist the arm backwards. Well, he, he wasn't really submitted to the Father because he was God too. No, he was submitted to the Father. Oh, well, you know, um, he was submitted because he wasn't quite God like the Father was. No, and that's exactly how it is in a marriage. Husband and wife are both equal. They're both fully saved. It's not an issue of that. It's an issue of the structure that God has established for the household, and he wants us to have a long, happy marriage. And in order to have that, you have to make a sacrifice. Men, your sacrifice is you have to tolerate your wife's different point of view and not get mad about it. Accept it. They don't have to be like you. That's fine. She's too soft on the kids. She's spoiling the kids. Let it go. That's why she's a woman and not a man. That's a good thing. God made her to be like that. You're also going to learn have to learn how to forgive her for, for the emotional things. Just let it go. Don't make it a big deal. You're going to have to learn how to love her in a way that's very uncomfortable. Women nag to show you what is bothering them, and if you're wise enough, you'll learn from it. 
Whereas a wife has to learn a lot of things and sacrifice a lot of things too. It's not just the men having to sacrifice. Women have to sacrifice too. One of the things that they have to sacrifice is challenging their husband, getting the one up on him. No, my way. No, my way. No, my way. It shouldn't be butting heads. You guys should come together. And that's the whole idea of sex. If sex is not two people mutually coming together, it's, it's not really very much fun at all. It's kind of just like work you know what i mean it just kind of it, it sucks all the intimacy out of the connection but if both of you are working towards the same goal it changes things drastically so wives are to be submitted to their husbands in the same way that jesus was to the father you're not less less of a person not at all you just have to have that attitude in you of not being uh, being a combative challenging vindictive and vengeful person Whereas husbands are required to show love and not be bitter since the emotional aspect gets to men. They, men hate the whole woman crying thing. They, they hate it. It's like nails on a chalkboard. Um, I told a funny story that I wish I could tell again here, but I don't think it would land quite as well as it did in, in worship practice the other day. Uh, but for, for a man, um, here's a good example. There was something that I was doing that was bothering Gracie ever since we got married. We've been married 12 years. From the 21st in May. 12 years I've been hurting Gracie's feelings. I didn't know. And I will say this, the grand majority of times that a wife asks for a divorce, the man typically has the exact same response. Why? It's not that we're dumb or clueless, it's just we think on a different frequency than a woman does. Whereas a woman is like, it's obvious, the writing's on the wall. The guy's just like, that wall? Is it actually somebody wrote on our wall? Like, where is it all painted off? Because I love you, baby. And that's just how guys think. And then they move on with the rest of the day, and like, she doesn't really mean it. And then she really does mean it. Like, oh, man. And uh, so that here I was hurting Gracie about something I didn't know about. So then she comes, and she's in tears beside herself. And I'm like, is it that time of the month or what's going on and come to find out i've been doing this thing that was hurting her for a year upon year that i was oblivious to the fact that i was even doing and that's what i'm talking about husbands you have to love your wives and not be bitter because their emotional aspect is going to get to you w women with their emotions and stuff it's going to bother you. you have to be willing to just let it go overlook it and let it go um and uh, so women, I already said this, women crave love as men crave respect and just the way that we're wired. Um, I will say this, though. There, there's been a lot of different stuff that I wish I could, once again, look more into this. But a lot of recent stuff has shown the way that women tend to be less uh, satisfied um, when their man, uh, when they get along with their man perfectly. So when the man um, kind of just uh, is a yes man himself, he's kind of a, a more fem effeminate man. Um, it's shown that their marriage has a lower quality of, of life. Uh, they, they don't enjoy each other's company as much. And the sex is much less enjoyable for both partners. In other words, what I'm saying is nat there's tension in marriage that's natural and, and even good um, for the health and development of the marriage. So, you know, oftentimes nowadays you hear all this stuff about the toxic man and all this different stuff. There's toxic, toxic women too. And uh, the trick to not being a toxic man is to be an untoxic man. Like it does not to, to stop being a man. Man, oh man, oh man. God made us male and female, and, and he made us in all of our irritating grandeur. <laughs> and that's okay. You have to accept, accept your wife for what she is, and your wife has to accept you for what you are. But you should change. You should change and develop and grow in those kinds of things. I'm not, not saying it because people do it nowadays. Oh, well, you know, you need to accept me for who I am. Yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah, that's true. But uh, you should probably not be a jerk for the rest of your life. So. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to touch that, Jimmy. Not even a little bit. Uh, so he goes through talking about husbands and wives, and he talks about the whole parent and child dynamic, and then he talks about uh, the boss and worker, or back then it would have been um, master and slave, uh, and he talks about those different dynamics. And then after he talks about those different specific ways to apply holiness, now he gets to chapter 4, and he's going to talk more generally about applying holiness. Uh, we'll just read these two verses here because I think that they summarize what he's talking about. Devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert in it with thanksgiving. Act wisely toward outsiders, making the most of the time. 
So now he's talking about applying holiness, not just in the church and in the church relationships with one another, but how the church interacts with other people and, you know, different relationships outside of just the body and also in the body. But he just kind of expands it to more applying holiness generally to the situations you go to. And these are the things that he says. Devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert and with thanksgiving. Act wisely toward outsiders, making the most of the time. So, uh, uh, so not just talking about the world, relationships with the world, but also uh, among Christians more, more, more generally. So not just me and my wife, but now me and Chuck and Ray, my wife and everybody. Uh, so that takes us to this kind of this kind of breakdown of the argument of Colossians, which I was trying to really take the time and break it down more, but I think you'll still get most of the idea of what I'm talking about. Uh, in chapter two or one, we were talking about Jesus, you know, all the things that Jesus is, how he's master of the universe, master of the church, all those different things. So that's their beliefs. He was uh, correcting their beliefs. Why? Because their beliefs affected their thoughts. So then in chapter two, he starts talking about, it might've been the end of chapter one, actually. Uh, he starts talking about changing the way that they're thinking. And I said about how it was very similar to things that he'd written in his, some of his other letters. So then those thoughts, they lead to actions. And we talked about the way that actions aren't just the things that we do. It's any choice that we make. Either we're choosing to think about things, choosing to talk about things, choosing to believe about things, choosing to do about things, and choosing to feel about things, right? So just in case you don't remember that, the whole choosing to feel about things, um, we, I use the example of lust. You notice an attractive woman? Okay. You noticed her. You dwell on the attractive woman, you're lusting. Make sense? You'd have to be dead to be a guy and not notice an attractive woman. It's just going to happen. But just because you notice something doesn't mean you have to keep noticing it. And so that would be the actions. You decide to keep looking. You decide to look away. So beliefs affect thoughts. Thoughts lead to actions. Actions govern our words, the whole singing songs and all that. Right? If you really want to sing a song to God, get your heart right, and you'll mean the words a lot more. So... Uh, and all, all four of those things, beliefs, thoughts, actions, and words, they all four kind of join together in, in a Power Ranger, uh, you know, go Power Rangers with the sword and everything and the wolf's head and all that. Uh, and they all join together to decide the choices that we make. And, uh, and those choices would be like uh, habits in our lives, thing, our, our lifestyle that we choose. So basically, I'll stop lying if these four things convict me, if I start believing the right things about Jesus, if I start thinking the right things in response to who Jesus is, if I start acting the right way as my thoughts have led me to, it will come out in my words. They'll, they'll, they'll combine out and make, make a, a product of I will stop lying. It's going to have an effect on me. A lot of times we ask, oh, what should I do when that's too late in the conversation? That's over here, and we should have started over there. What things am I believing that are wrong? What things am I thinking about that are wrong? Then what things am I doing that are wrong? Can I make sense? So um, if you're stuck in that place, uh, you're stuck in a habit that you can't get over, and you're saying, what, what, what do I do? Where do I go from here? Maybe ask a different question. Go further back on the process. Paul started all the way back with their beliefs of Jesus. And then he ended with how they, how, what problems they were having in their marriage. He didn't just start at their marriage and say, what are we doing wrong in our marriages? <laughs> he went back to the beliefs and then the thoughts. And the, see what I mean? So, okay, all right. So that gives us this, this little deal here. Yep, it's pretty, ain't it? So uh, the ethics was the last major section of the book. We talked about think holy, act holy, talk holy, apply holiness to your life generally. And then final greetings in verses 7 through 18. A lot of good stuff in the greetings, once again. Uh, just nothing we're going to look at because then we'd be here all night. So I, I said that I would get through the rest of Colossians. Then we did, in a way. Okay, we did. It's just a little lie. It's not a big lie. <laughs> uh, so the main point of Colossians, Christ is sovereign. So since Christ is sovereign, keep him sovereign in your lives. Keep him sovereign in your relationships and keep them so sovereign in your conduct. It's a good uh, summarization of, of what we've been looking at in Colossians. That's the main idea of the whole book. Really, there's a lot of good stuff there. I, once again, I really, really encourage you to go in and read it through a couple of times. So how does that, any of that nonsense that we just looked at, I mean, that's just Michael's ramblings, right? How does that really apply to your life? Well, uh, I've, I've, I've written down three specific things. First off, 
you don't control how others treat you. You can't control how others treat you. We, we try to. Um, I know many a Christian who's tried to just sit there and police other people's behavior. They try to make sure everybody else is doing the right thing. It doesn't matter what things they're doing, just as long as you're not doing it. Um, you can see the mouth is always open, right? These homosexuals nowadays, they're ruining the church. Did I also, did I tell you what Lauren was doing this afternoon? Wait till you hear about it. See what I mean? Uh, I'm going to control everybody else. I'm going to police everybody else, but not me. Rather than trying to control others, treat others in a holy manner. You are holy. Act it. Act it with how you treat others. They are holy. Show it with how you treat them. Do it in a holy manner. So, so that, that applies to both. A holy manner means how I am treating you. That's how, what I'm doing. And then it's also focused on you. Treat you holy. You are a holy thing, and I'm treating you. See what I mean? So um, goes on both ends there. The second thing that we can apply from the book of Colossians is, I, I just put more, more generally speaking, move forward. Um, every Christian, every Christian has to constantly be in the tug of war between ourselves and God. doesn't matter how long you've been saved. The problem is the longer you're saved, the more you start believing your own lies about you. I'm doing good. I don't need anybody's help. I'm so much more mature. When we first get saved, we don't believe those lies because we know I needed God so much. There's no way that I can possibly do this on my own. Well, the longer the new kind of wears off, and it's like, yeah, Jesus on the cross, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm doing really good. And so that kind of becomes our anthem is me. <laughs> and uh, so if I had to say any one thing, I would just say move forward. You, you improve yourself. Keep, and what I mean by improving yourself, I'm not being, talking about becoming a better person. I'm talking about seeking God more. Maybe there's something in your life that God's convicting you of. Great. That's a great place to be in. Maybe there's nothing in your life that God's convicting you of. That's a bad place to be in. Either way, seek after God until something's there. Improve as a Christian. Change. Grow. Challenge yourself. How many times do we just, no, I'm right because I thought it. Well, maybe you should question your thoughts. Maybe how you're treating your spouse worked 20 years ago. It doesn't work now. I mean, uh, I know that I'm still learning with my marriage, and I hope that I never stop learning. So that's how I was treating my wife back then. It was the best I could give back then, but now I can do better, so I'm doing better. See what I mean? Uh, so don't worry about what other people are doing. You work on you. You challenge yourself. Say, okay, where can I grow? Where can I learn? But remember, we kind of like to lie to ourselves, so that will bring us to our third point. So I'll show it in just a minute. Uh, and lastly, know God more, which comes out with loving others more. If you're knowing God more, then you'll love others more. So look at your life and say, am I loving others more? This is a very difficult thing for me to do, going and becoming a senior pastor. <laughs> and obviously, and, and I thought I was a bad person for this. I thought, oh, no, you're not supposed to feel this. But uh, I've been reading a lot of missionaries, and they, they talk about the exact same thing. The way that you question yourself, is this the right thing? Did I make a huge mistake? <laughs> Should I really go through with this? And, uh, you know, maybe thing. Um, you know, they're going out on the field. Yeah, they're dedicating their life to missions. Yeah, of course that's the right thing to do. And still, right as they're getting on the plane, they're like, is this the right thing to do? Am I making a giant mistake? It's a natural thing, and that's part of the tendency to step out of our comfort zone. It's not going to maybe feel right at first. I don't know. Maybe it will be right. Maybe I am making a huge, huge mistake. We'll find out eventually. But if there's one thing I've learned, it's something that, that Sam Chan said one actually says as a bunch. If you wait until you're sure about a decision, it'll be too late. It'll be too late. So try it. I mean, worst comes to worst, you make a couple of mistakes. But, I mean, as long as you're not making mistakes trying to disobey God, you're trying to make mistakes to obey him, well, then good, fine. I mean, it's like the food pantry. Maybe having a food pantry was a horrible idea. Who knows? But it seems to be doing something. So let's keep doing it until we decide not to. <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> it's kind of like that. So uh, then the last thing here, make a list. This is something each of you can do and should do this week, okay? Make a list of how you could improve. How, how you could improve, not just uh, generally, but let's give some specific things. How you treat your spouse. How can you improve how you treat your spouse this week? Make a list. How could you improve how you treat your children this week? Make a list. 
if your children, excuse me, if your children no longer live at the home with you, um, once again, not a big deal. A lot of times when our kids move out, we kind of uh, try to have a relationship with them that's not overly helpful, like um, maybe interfering with their marriage. <laughs> a great example. Uh, maybe trying to override how they parent their own children. Uh, you know, maybe um, kind of helicoptering them instead of just kind of letting them break free and learn their own mistakes. You know what I mean? We, it's hard to let go and let them make their own mistakes. And that's, I think, something that everybody struggles with. But that's a good example of make a list of how you can improve. How can you improve uh, how you treat uh, people in the church? How you could improve on a ministry that you're doing? Write down things that you've got going on in your life. And then write out a plan, one thing in each category that you can improve on. And if you can't think of a single thing, therein lies the problem. Therein lies the problem. And then after you've made this list of how you can improve in these different areas, how you can let God change you in different aspects of your life, then do it. Making a list is great. Being introspective is great. You know, uh, looking to the future, that's great. But a plan, just being a plan, is nothing. Think of it like this. God promised that he was going to save us from our sins. We've been waiting for it since the Old Testament Kind of a big promise. What would happen if Jesus never actually came? Well, it would be a lie. If God didn't actually come, it would be a lie, which would then mean we couldn't really trust him on anything because he's a liar. See what I mean? But he fulfilled that, and the Bible actually says that he did it to prove his character. It says that in Romans. He, he was proving himself. And uh, so if he's going to do that, then, you know, then the things that you set your heart on actually do it. There's a lot of people can make plans to get and get healthy for the new year, right? But then they get a gym membership and go for about half of a month, and the rest of the three months kind of doesn't really work out. And then you forget to take yourself off the auto renewal because they had a discount. And then the next thing you know, you're paying for something for forever, and it just I miss, I'm supposed to go on Tuesdays, and then I missed for the past. 470 Tuesdays, and uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding, guys. It's okay to laugh a little. Laugh, please. Uh, I think we're done. Uh, any questions about Colossians before we close off? If you do, you better ask it now, because you ain't getting another chance. You only have five things left. Four, three, two, oh, eh, no more. Uh, Lord, thank you for everything you're doing uh, in us and through us. I pray that you'd help us to learn more about your word and uh, help us to, to grow closer to you and, uh, uh, to be in, and to be uh, improving in our relationship with you, not just staying in the same place. And uh, help us to, to keep moving forward and to keep putting on these things you told us to, the, the, the goodness and the kindness that you told us to put on, that we, that we would put that on in our lives, Lord, and, and grow more. Uh, help us to change the, and unlearn the things that we've been doing wrong for so long. and. Uh, to move forward. And we love you, Lord. Amen.